Welcome to the photo walk. There's a there's a notice here straight away before I go through this gate. Dear walkers, as part of our commitment to enhancing the environment, we ploughed this strip in order to prepare the ground for the creation of an annual wildflower meadow. Oh, that means I'm in insect land, doesn't it? Oh, Neil, not again. Yes, last week I did get bitten. There were some, there were some strange looking bites on me, I can tell you. Mix contains cornflowers, poppies, cornfield marigolds, chamomile, corn cockle. Is it Borage? Isn't he from a film? Very nice. Oh, Neil. Oh, there we go. Well, I'll obviously be respecting that. And I tell you what I'll do immediately. I'll, uh, I'll get a picture. Hold on. That's fantastic. I mean, I can't identify what e each of these flowers are. And I can't really get up high at this point. It's one of those moments where you think, I wish I had a drone. But uh, let me see if I can do it some form of justice. I've got my X100 V with me. And uh, I think because it's a very bright day, it's a beautiful day, I'm going to put the ND filter on. F4, beautiful skies, white puffy clouds, and a strip of wild flowers. I'll pop that on the show page. Anyway... I've, uh, I've come to a place called Great Shefford this week. It's a bit windy. I'm not sure whether you can hear that. Whoosh, across the microphone. I might be going out to record this all again if it is. I've come to Great Shefford. Great Shefford is a village where... Well, I lived here for a few years. It's got to be about 20 years ago. But as I came back down through the village to find myself a parking space, uh, nothing's really changed. The church is the same. I'm sure the, the spa shop is the same. I visited my old house. I'm sure the blinds that I put up 20-something years ago, they don't look like they've changed. It's not changed. I've come to a time warp. Sometimes though, a constant is nice, isn't it? Anyway, welcome to... Photography Daily, the Friday photo walk. It's the mailbag edition of the week, a photography show that takes a camera and goes walking into the sounds of the countryside. Partly to make pictures, yes, but uh, mostly to talk with you and hear from you and share with you thoughts from photographers or anyone who just likes making pictures in their spare time. So, pros, hobbyists, iPhoneographists, if there is such a thing. It's the podcast made by your words that you send in to studio at photographydaily.show and some of the messages that you leave in our wonderful Facebook group. Today, trying to find an Instagram alternative. Some honesty from a photographer trying to find his peace with a world that doesn't just offer up milk and honey to us. Brilliant photography from listeners all around the world. Imposter syndrome. Is it real? The first thing that you see feature, walking across Spain, escaping in your mind with a camera, and inspirational words from Melissa Roth and Jason P. Howe finding their special places. Dan Milner talks about having confidence in you and your work and your value. And John Brockless on photo pilgrimages. And before we start, a word about MPB.com, who kindly support us on this show. Quality used gear is a way of driving the circular economy. And of course, this makes it a sustainable way to shop as well. And this is the, the kind of thing I like, because some companies treat plastic and unnecessary packaging as if it's just normal. Not MPB.com. I bought a lens uh, a little while back and it came with a note which said each year MPB saves 1,200 football pitches worth of plastic bubble wrap by using recycled packaging. It's a small change, but it adds up to a big difference. Just another reason why I believe in driving the circular economy by buying my used camera gear from MPB.com. And you can too if you're in the States, Europe or the UK. Right, are we ready? Today, a bit of sunscreen on. Well, in this part of the world anyway. Cameras ready, lens caps off, boots on, let's walk. The faint murmurings in the background of uh, somebody chopping down trees. Oh, how romantic these photo walks are. Neil, you're never happy. Well, that's the job of photographers, isn't it? We're never, we're never happy. There's lots of wind today as well, so I'm a little bit worried about the, the wind coming across in the, uh, in the recording. You know, Where's Neil? Shh. Sounds like he's in the Arctic. Shh. I hope he's all right. Shh. Any polar bears? Anyway, uh, right, I want to start off this week with um, the Facebook group. Thank you very much to those of you that have joined the, uh, 
the Photography Daily Facebook group. There is now a page. The page is there for sharing uh, the episodes. And if you, if you get a chance to do that, that really does help us. So there is a Facebook page there that you can like and join. There's, there's nothing really posted on there in the same style that, um, that you get from the group itself with all the conversation. Hang on a minute. <laughs> this is supposed to be dry ground. You've walked into a bog. I purposely didn't wear my big heavy walking boots this week. I thought, no, my my favourite DMs will do. I can just see Carl. What are you wearing? What have you done? I'm walking closer and closer to this tree felling. I'm trying to get away from noises like that. If I turn this way, you can't hear it so well. Um, Yeah, so there is a Facebook page now as well as a group which... uh, I'd love, you to, I'd love you to like, obviously, because you can share the episodes from there. It's easier to do than, than, than share within the Facebook group, which is practically impossible to do from, isn't it? But the Facebook group is very good because it's a safe place to come and chat about photography and those things that you, that you enjoy, uh, problems you have even, sometimes a problem shared and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I've gone into the, uh, the Facebook group for a couple of uh, opening things this week in the in the photo walk jeremy henderson uh, first on a, on a very current conversation he said neil you touched on a topical point on a photo walk episode which was last week's wasn't it 245 instagram and its future as a photo sharing platform instagram's owner suggests it's not for photographers anymore jeremy says it's it's swamped with videos and video ads so what is the alternative no single candidate yet But one app that may gain traction, says Jeremy, is Vero. It's not Vero, is it? It's Vero. V-E-R-O. Which has a lot of Insta-like goodness, says Jeremy, but without the videos and the Insta cropping. Uh, A few of my pals and I are using it. My my tag on my profile is at Jezza, J-E-Z-Z-A-H. Only one picture up there so far. You have to start somewhere, Jezza, don't you? So we'll see if there's a future in it. What are, what are the alternatives that, are, that other folk are using? Well, let me say, first of all, I looked up Vero, and, uh, which is also online. You can go to vero.co. I'll put the, the link on the show page, as always. Uh, it's like, well, it, look, it seems to me, it's like joining a club where people can clearly see what you're into. You can, you can post, let's call it nods, to your favourite loops of music. So you can't put a whole track up there. It's not Spotify. So you're not listening to it like Spotify is what I mean by that. Or you can put links up to stuff that you've liked. Perhaps will inspire other people. You can do voice and video calls, ebooks. You can put pictures up, as Jezza did from his own gallery. So it's a, it's a kind of, I don't know, kind of Spotify highlights, sort of meets whatsapp meets insta touch of facebook but it does look quite slick i'll i'll grant you that it's been around a good few years so it seems to me it's not it's probably not taken off if it's been around quite a while and and i look i'd not heard of it i know that's no great barometer but i asked a couple of friends and they said mm, vero mm, don't know that one so you know it's either not taken off or it's or it's not quite garnered the support but uh, to be fair, it was launched at a time Insta was becoming the heavyweight champion of the universe. And uh, I looked them up for some more information. The app was founded by Lebanese billionaire Ayman Harari. 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 He was the son of former Lebanese prime minister, actually. The, uh, the name is taken from the Esperanto word for truth. The app launched in 2015 as an alternative to Facebook and also the photo blogging app Instagram. Within weeks of its release, the app surged in popularity, though users expressed mixed reports with some feeling confused about how the app works. And yeah, I've got to say, that's exactly what I found. It's such a confusing... It's everything. It's just doing too much. And whilst that's quite useful, everything in one place, etc., I'm sure the... uh, I'm sure the founder thought, ah, we'll, we'll do everything, then nobody will need to use anything else. And, but it just doesn't practically work that way. People find their favourites and 
sometimes there's you know, specialism within an app and that's what's caused all this furore hasn't it about uh, about instagram don't change instagram we love it the way it is don't you dare touch it and that and that and that's the battleground isn't it and i i have to say that vero i looked at it looks slick like it very well designed in so far as what it looks like but poorly designed i think in in understanding immediately what the thing's about it just it's too busy that's the word it's too busy now i know facebook is busy but it's obvious what you need to do when you get there i know that twitter with everything that you can do with it can be busy but it's very obvious how to use it and that i think is the is what's been lost here i think the app's just too complicated and do I think Instagram's on the way out? No, I don't, actually. And Johnny Keeley, who I talked about last week, I spoke to him just a couple of nights ago as a, a, an interview. It's come, it might be a, a feature, really, rather than an interview, where we really did uh, drill down about Instagram, what's changing. This idea that recommendations are going to probably replace this rather antiquated hashtagging system. And, and I might put that out next week. It might be the week after because there's possibly somebody else that I think would be good to join in with uh, that particular debate. So uh, in answer to what other members of the group are using instead of Insta, Graham Harry's popped up. He tried UPIC but was a bit underwhelmed. Matt Searle's blip photo. There was talk of other platforms such as LinkedIn. John Kenny, one of our patrons, wondered if people used, uh, used, it, uh, used uh, that particular app, LinkedIn. And again, wonderful for business to business, in my opinion. But it is, isn't it? It's business to business. That's not just my opinion. That's what it's best for. But as a photo sharing app, I mean, you can share photos on it. Great for the business community, but an Instagram replacement? No, not at all. Not at all, unless LinkedIn were to think of some cute idea which went sort of way off message for them. I don't think so. But uh, I'd certainly be interested to, to hear what you, you have to say about this conversation. Uh, and, and I wonder, in some respects, whether people have jumped up and down a little bit too much about Instagram. Oh, don't, don't touch my Instagram. How dare you? And then also in the Facebook group, Nanto Sealands. I was uh, thinking about your request in the photo walk last week to close our eyes and visualize our dream photography locations. It wasn't quite that hypnotic, was it? My first instinct was the, the usual Iceland or New York, and then I remember the work of Guy Havel and his uh, Back Roads of Americana series. I think this will be a fascinating journey through, uh, through small town and abandoned America. You can check out Guy's amazing work uh, below. He gave me a link which I'll, um, which I'll pass on to you. And what incredible work that is. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Really fascinating, very sparse documentary pictures of um of parts of america reclaimed by by what well, extreme and often very arid landscape which kind of uh, swallows the buildings leaves leaves them standing but uh, leaves them standing by themselves you know everything else around them seems to fall fall down go away it's almost like the other buildings have walked off we're not part of this anymore see you later and it just goes to show you can't beat mother nature isn't it it's, it's a it's a collection of you can't beat mother nature pictures made on large format cameras, just beautiful work. There are, there are some social statements too, such as the, uh, the picture of the sign for the angel lady's brothel. Out of business, says the sign. And uh, out of a building too, by the looks of it. And then, then a very lonely, very pink adult bookstore with a large advertising board in front of it, which invites you to join your local church. I loved his work and uh, actually closer to home which for him is australia the uh, nobody's home covid series uh, for me good subject this is a quote from his site for me good subject matter will always come before good light i'm not interested in searching for beauty and again i've totally detached myself from trying to satisfy a mainstream audience thank you nanto and i uh, thoroughly recommend you go and look at um, go and look at his work it's absolutely phenomenal and if you have any thoughts about the, this Instagram debate at the moment, because I dare say a fair few of us use it, then I'd be really interested to hear from you. Send me an email to uh, studio at photographydaily.show or you can... Uh, can you hear that wind going through those trees up there? Listen to it. Wow. And it's picking up a bit, actually. 
Yeah, so send me an email. Or, of course, if you'd like to join the Facebook group, oh, it'd be wonderful to see you in there. I noticed that we're very close to our th- thousandth member. We might even get there next week. So, yeah, you can drop a message in there. What do you think about Instagram? What do you think is going to happen? And what would you like to see happen with it? Hang on. We've got uh, got a gate here and a very long, dark, what looks like dark corridor. With fences on each side. Bordered by, ouch, thank you. More stingers. Ooh, make yourself thin, Neil. Not so easy these days. Oh, there we go. We're out in the light again. And the fork goes right. But, oh, I don't know. I think, it just, I think it just leads up to the road. I don't think there's a footpath on the other side. On the other side of the road. I don't think there is one. Shall we investigate together? Yeah, all right, okay. So, um, right, let's dip into the mailbag, which, of course, is a real mixture of your thoughts about what you've heard, what you've been, what you've been up to photographically, any thoughts that you have personally about your own photography, anything that you've seen. I love, I love getting tip-offs of stuff that you've seen just, we had a, just as we had a moment ago. Yeah, I don't think this, um, don't think this path is leading anywhere. It's actually a private path. You're going to end up with probably a very angry dog at the end of it. What are you doing here? Well, I thought it was a footpath. No, it's not. Give me your leg. Why are you talking like car? Talking of cars, I think we're right next to the road, aren't we? Can we drop away from this? Yeah. Let's turn down here. Perfect. Wonderful. Right. Um, yes, our friend Singe has featured a few times of late, but uh, I did want to include his mail as the as the bonus Monday edition and last Wednesday featuring uh, Jason P. Howe with his extraordinary story has has obviously left um, has left some thoughts with you. And if you're not quite sure about so well, who Jason P. Howe is, and you haven't heard those episodes yet and you're not necessarily familiar with his work, let me, let me fill you in. Jason worked in a, a camera store for, I think it's eight years actually, isn't it? I keep saying best part of a decade, but the, the story is eight years. And um, it's almost like I'm in a maze here. <laughs> There's lots of forks left, right? Shall we go left? Shall we go right? So Jason worked in this camera shop for eight years. And uh, he, he would watch people come and go in the shop over these years. And two people, I think, in particular fascinated him. There was a, a travel photographer and a war photographer. Did I tell this story last week? You know, I think you did, Neil. All right. Well, I'll tell it again, just in case some people haven't heard it. Hold on. Get through a gate. Lots of gates this week. Fantastic for the sound effects. Not sound effects. Foley. Real sound. Oh, whatever. Don't get lost, Neil. No, I won't. Okay, continue. Yes, so um, Jason, um, Jason met these, these two photographers. I, I think we're quite inspirational to him. But uh, he decided against travel as being something as a photographer he liked to do. And uh, he was, however, fascinated uh, by the work and, uh, and this, this person who was a war photographer, although I yeah, think his cameras were fairly battered every time he came in. And um, he... he In essence, he sold everything that he earned, or owned rather, everything that he owned, and um, bought himself a couple of rangefinder cameras, some lenses, 50 rolls of film, and flew to Colombia to go cover conflict, the Civil War conflict, which at the time had been going for the best part of four decades. And that's that's what Jason did. He would have to come back in between to to sort of top up on money. But um, that's the story about Jason. And the the two episodes are are there. There was one last Wednesday and one Monday just gone, which covered two parts of his conflict life, if you like. The first part, the Colombian journey that he made, coverage of that particular event. And then the second one, when he moved over to the Middle East and became, if you will, I'm not quite sure whether he'd like this phrase, but became, if you will, a bit bit more mainstream. Would that be a... Yeah, I think that would be fair. Um, certainly not mainstream of what he saw. I mean, ghastly, some of the stuff he saw. And um, including almost 
being taken by a, a suicide bomber. So yeah, it was quite a harrowing story that bit. But then it it, it sort of it comes around and it ends. Well, let me read the let me read the mail and it, it'll make sense. I and mean, I'm not I'm not sure how many people this mail will resonate with, but it certainly resonated with me. And it's so important that I wanted to to share these words as soon as possible. Neil, I've just finished today's podcast whilst looking through the book. So he's talking about Columbia Between the Lines. And uh, Singe went off to buy himself one of those books. The book is amazing. And as you say, all manual focus. Old school McCullin and Burroughs style. And with as much flair and storytelling. Do you know, it almost seems inappropriate, doesn't it, to say... To, to compare him to uh, Larry Bur- Burroughs and Don McCullin and say that he has a similar kind of flair. But um, I think you're right, Singe. I really saw that in this particular work. I truly did. I'm highly admiring of, uh, of Jason's work and of him, in a way, says Singe. He's the alter ego I wish I'd have been or even can be. As the bonus edition interview started to end and Jason was outlining where he is now, mentally and spiritually I felt I knew where he was in the world. Now bear with me, as obviously I have no parallel with him, but for the past 18 months I've been re-gauging myself and my photography. Getting back to simple, getting my brain to calm down, using an X-Pro 1 and 2 and prime lenses only, some manual focus. No combat experience for me, not even my RAF service during the Gulf War. Uh, I was UK based. But, uh, and this is where, Singe, I appreciate you sharing. I so do. Um, my breakdown and depression six years ago over my eldest daughter's first anorexia, and with her quite literally knocking on heaven's door, she's been there twice now, with two year long stays in specialist units took me into a huge shift personality wise I would imagine it would I need quiet and can't deal with lots going on if I could I'd live in the fields of Dorset I'd love to make projects of local life as Jason is doing I'd hold a local exhibition but I'm not brave enough I am that man treading water yes I should probably fill in one slight a gap in my uh, my explanation of Jason's story that he's, he now lives in Andalusia. He can't do what he uh, did before. And, uh, he did some NGO work photographing those that were protecting the rhinos. But uh, even that, I think he thought, well, that's sort of going back over old ground. And so now he makes these stories of, of people that live in that region. Uh, you know, the handful of people in some, some respects that share the, the hill where he lives. So uh, thank you very much for your honesty with that, Singe. Anyway, there's a segue, uh, which this mail certainly does. He goes on to say, I loved Michael Beecham's exhibition, which I visited last week. Lockdown t- took me to the shared front garden of my partner's flat, of which I shared with her during this pandemic. We both lost our jobs uh, when the airline we worked for collapsed. I've been uh, photographing flowers ever since, mostly in black and white with occasional colour. I did also take my camera out uh, on our one-hour walks. I felt slightly guilty, but I was only stopping occasionally to photograph a flower overhanging the pavement. No cling film for me. Oh, I should (laughs) explain the relevance of that. Yeah, Michael uh, placed cling film over the lens of his camera, which makes for these... uh, This exhibition he's talking about, by by the way, Singe's talking about, I will link to it again. Although it's, uh, no, it's closing, isn't it? Or closed. So, but you can see the photographs online. That's important. Um, it was called Sanity Within the Stasis. And Michael had, um, had essentially, don't buzz me, please, B. I'm just doing, I'm just passing through. All right, go on. Um, yeah, Sanity Within the Stasis was this uh, tremendous project that Michael made in, in his garden, black and white. Uh, the, and and the, sort of the, the effect that, the covering partly covering the lens with cling film was that you get these sort of soft i don't i mean they are they are kind of focally soft actually i keep saying they're not focally soft but they're they're bound to be to an extent aren't they but it's equally softened the the expressive nature of these pictures hang on neil you're sounding a bit arty farty now i know there's another gate gates galore on today's walk hang on this one won't open there we go so uh yeah there's there's the relevance of the Michael Beecham exhibition that Singe is referring to there. 
I have a library interested in my images, says Singe. Oh, well, the ones that you've made, the floral ones you've made. Oh, if I can produce another nine, more as a sort of base submission. So that's something I produce for me and not for anyone else. And that was what Michael was doing for his exhibition. And during the lockdown, when he did this sanity within the stasis, you know, finding his sanity, I don't know whether I explained that bit properly, he, um, he made the work for him. It just happened to turn into something along the way. And in his case, an exhibition, possibly a book, and certainly this uh, amazing, wonderful body of work on his, uh, on his website. So uh, I produce for me and not for anyone else. So maybe in this later life, mid-50s, life can be reinvented. I've reinvented my work life over the years many times, but this is my biggest challenge, finding myself. And we have a similar sort of email celebrating uh, finding ourselves again later on in the show. And this is why I think Jason resonates with me. Sorry for the waffle, but today's concluding interview seemed to pull it all into line, and I wasn't expecting that. Wow, a singe. Thank you very much for your, it's not waffle at all, by the way, your detailed email. And um, I'll share you something. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to say, Singe, except that I, I will, of course, be playing a clip from Monday's show in a moment, which uh, had, uh, you know, one of our largest audiences. Were you pressing play over and over, Singe? I think, <laughs> I think you were. But... Um, I'll share with you that uh, males like yours, now this isn't me, this isn't a cry out saying, please send me love, not at all, far from it. But it is to say that males like yours, because producing a podcast, talking into a microphone like this, and, uh, and often in the studio, until it's quite late into the night, um, it's, uh, it's, quite a, it's quite a lonely affair, another gate, here we go. <laughs> Another gate. Uh, it's a silent gate. There we go. A ni- there's a nice, hin- nice hinge noise, at least. But yes, it's quite a lonely affair. And so uh, sometimes you do think, am I making a difference? <laughs> it's, what, it's, what I'm doing, it's, what I'm, it's what I'm doing, sort of reaching out and helping people. And so to receive an email like yours, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you. Um, but, um, yeah, the photo of the podcast... This is sort of, you, you were talking about new starts, and this is my new start in many ways. It's not, it's not completely alien to me, of course it's not. And uh, I've been making a podcast with, with Kev Mullins, my reprobate friend, as he's now known on this podcast, the Fujicast, for a, a, while, a while longer than that. Oh, please don't buzz me, helicopter. Go the other way. It's a, sort of your faith in this project and the stories that... Uh, that, that really make a difference to me. So thank you very much for, for your, your mail in. And hopefully that's resonated with some people. Um, shall we play? I think we should. Before we get buzzed by this helicopter. Shall we, shall we play uh, a bit of episode 246? Jason P. Howe, part two. Swapping firefights for fireflies. And uh, celebrating his move out of the conflict zone into, uh, into Andalusia. I think we've got a... Have we got an air show going on? Goodness. I took a break from photography for six years and barely made a photograph for six years. Wow. And then in the last couple of years, I've started shooting again. I went back to Africa for three months and discovered that my thirst for travel was quenched pretty much once and for all. Um, and I kind of was thinking, well, why is it that we, we really want to make great images and we seem to go to the hardest possible place where nothing works, we don't understand the culture and the language, and we just make things harder and harder. And in some ways, people seem to hope that the exoticness of the image is going to kind of sell it. Whereas if we want to, if, if, from my point of view, if we want to make really powerful images that are going to have a lot of information, so I need to make the situation as conducive to creating that as possible. So when the when the pandemic came along, I managed to secure an assignment to spend a few days a month over one year documenting the lives of what I see as a disappearing tribe here in Andalusia in the south of Spain, which are goat herders and shepherds living on the sides of mountains with their small flocks of animals. <laughs> and I have totally fallen back in love with photography. And I, I, I talk about photography all the time and I, um, absorbing as much new work as I can and thinking why would anyone want to retire from something that they love doing 
Yes. You, you would, you know, why would you ever want to retire from photography if you were creating something that you believe has value? And so when you when we look at the work of, uh, of our industry leaders, the great photographers like Salgado, who's still shooting at 77 years of age mm. and probably is planning another 10-year project knowing him, mm. yeah, what a great inspiration. If, if you're photographing something in a commercial setting and it's literally just to earn money, it's really easy to see why you can't wait to stop doing this. And so I think, you know, it, it, took a, it took a while. It took a break. It took stepping away from conflict and stepping away from news as well and the very sort of transient nature of news photography to get back into working on a story that I care about. There we go, Jason. Jason P. Howe. And I'll leave the links, of course, on the, uh, for, for the, the excerpts that we've featured. I'll leave those links on the, the website show page. I've just stopped over the top of this, this brook. Is it a river? When does a, when does a brook turn to a river? Is it to do with flow or the width or the depth? I know that a farm is cheekily taking some, siphoning some water from it. But I can see, I can see a pipe in it. Let me just get a picture just to the scene. What are we at? Shutter speed. 100th f4 iso 320 there you go another one of those marvelous it's quite nice because the sun's sort of illuminating the the middle portion of this picture i I like it when you in layering where you go from dark to light to dark or or vice versa they always feel a lot more three-dimensional to me um we had a few comments actually before i move on from from jason uh from the the show pages following uh his two editions uh, 246 and 244. Catherine Cunningham, mesmerising interview, she said. That's very kind of you indeed. I felt as if I was standing in the actual moment as he described the clearing of IEDs and Stephen Bainbridge's injury, the decisions that are made by a photographer when a catastrophic uh, event occurs. Every word was powerful in creating his visual story. His choice of Andalusia, his, uh, his projects with a rural life, choices for a more simple life, his camera, content over image quality and no need for technical perfection lessons learned as i listened lessons learned yeah i felt that too catherine i share that with you and lynn fraser fascinating conversation i was as interested to hear about his upbringing as a jehovah's witness as i was about his time in colombia he says he learned uh, many life lessons his concept uh, i suppose yes he did i mean his concept of dying um was was very different And uh, it would be fair to say that, of course, as he did talk about being sent out by his parents to canvas on the door for the uh, for the religion, for their beliefs, um, was uh, was such that he learned very quickly how to how to interact with people, to have them uh, understand his uh, his thoughts. And uh, that came in very handy. Uh, later on there was a there was a part actually i wanted to we talked about this but it wasn't in the interview so let me share this with you because it was really interesting to hear god that helicopter's come what are you are you doing training today is that what this is is there any chance you could possibly train somewhere else because really i'd much rather be listening to the to the babbling brook which is down there which look nobody can hear it's one of those little R22s, Robinson R22s. It's a, it's, a, it's a little gnat in the sky, so it is. But we can't hear anything down here. Look, there's birds singing, there's a brook babbling. Go on, be on your way. Right, yes. Breathe and breathe. Yeah, that, uh, that story was that um, at one particular uh, point he was asked in, I think it was in Iraq, there was a large group of men around him and uh, he was asked the question, are you American or are you British? What do you think he said? What would you say? In that moment, people that you don't know around you that are asking, and apparently they look quite, quite threatening or were threatening in the manner in which they asked, what would you say, British or American? He very quickly said Irish. Um, you need to be fairly Fairly quick thinking, I think, to be in that sort of situation. So, uh, right, here's some, uh, some pictures uh, that I want, to, uh, I want to, to share on the show page and a story from, from Ryan Katsana's, uh, by the way, the final shot in the collection, Ryan, of the undulating fields and the grain store in the midground. Oh, delicious. 
I mean, it's like somebody's pulling sheets up and down to make patterns in the landscape. Um, difficult to describe, but easy to understand when you see it. It'll be on the show page today, and I've used it as the thumbnail, the uh, feature picture um, equally as well. So go, go have a look at that. The Pelusi says, I've lived in the Pacific Northwest for over 13 years now. For about 14 years, I've wanted to visit the Palouse region of eastern Washington State. I hope I'm saying that correctly. My son's about to turn 14, and I decided to take him on a father-son road trip to get some quality time together before he begins high school. The drive out there is about six hours from my hometown of Vancouver, Washington, and it was uh, everything I could have hoped for, and, and, and more in terms of photographic opportunities as well as bonding time with my son. That's wonderful, isn't it? Um, I must admit, I'm, my, my bonding time with our youngest, Thomas, is just simply taking the cameras out and, uh, and photographing trains. Easy. Not, not as expensive as a theme park. Although, actually... It's costing, us that, it's costing us almost as much in lenses, I think. Anyway, he goes on to say, armed with a, an X100V, an X-T4, an iPhone 12 Pro, oh, lucky you, and a DJI Mavic Air 2 drone. I had almost everything covered. At the last minute, I realised I, I need a very long lens to get the shots that I'd seen other people achieve. So, uh, luckily for me, a 100-400mm to lens was available at the local camera store. And the rental for the whole weekend was only one day's fees. There we go, job done. I think a lot of people don't um, uh, don't think of renting. I think it's very easy sometimes to say, oh, I've got to buy that. Oh, what do I need to sell to buy that? Which is fine because sometimes I know you want to, to own the equipment because you're going to use it again and again and again. So that's a valid reason. But equally, if you just want to use something for a weekend, you'd be amazed at the amount of camera shops that actually have a rental um, system set up if not through them but through maybe through a, a third party so it's certainly something you should you, sh you should think about once out there i was very happy says ryan had uh, the big lens available as some of the best available shots are a couple of miles away from their best vantage point ironically i am by no by no means a, a landscape photographer I, I identify as a street photographer for personal enjoyment and i'm a full-time family photographer as well but i definitely felt like an imposter out there doing my best to fake it. If nothing else, it was fantastic to get out of the house, spend time with my son, and see a most amazing part of this country. This region is a bucket list trip. There's no place like it on the planet. You're telling me. Those pictures are on the show page today, and you'll see exactly what, uh, what Ryan means. That is most certainly bucket list worthy. But um, on the... Oh, my word. I've just come into an opening here, and uh, look at this. There's a... There's a a tumble down uh, very 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 old barn in front of me maybe i should try and get closer to it but the path doesn't really take me that way I'll tell you what i'll do let me put the uh, let me put the emails down there for a second crash and um, i'll get a picture of it it's a beautiful big cumulus cloud above it with just enough gray in it to, to sort of to glue the the whole structure together photographically Bottom left-hand corner. I'm going to have the. I'm going to have the. Um, there we go. I'm going to have the barn, and then just in the right-hand corner. I better get this quickly because the cloud is moving reasonably, reasonably rapidly. Let me get one shot. 150th f4 ISO 160. I've got the uh, ND filter on, haven't I? Yeah. There we go. And the bottom right-hand corner, just a little bit below the third. There's a small tree that just makes a nice little detail. Right in the lower, lower part of the picture. That cumulus, I, d I want to get the whole thing in. I didn't, I, chop I chopped off the head before. There we go, that's better. I'll put that on the show page. But coming back to um, imposter syndrome. Do I have another term for that. I call it, uh, I call it visitor, being a visitor. Now, am I in a farmer's field here? Am I permitted to be here? I think so. I want to get closer to this barn. But uh, yeah, I, I, I term it as visitor because for many years in the social photography arena, particularly within wedding photography, I, I felt like I felt like a visitor. I didn't feel like I particularly belonged. I didn't. I, I was thinking, well, if my pictures aren't that great. Somebody's going to find me out. But um, 
I'm not saying inevitably they don't and you can just get away with pictures that aren't so good. Uh, you, you, you should show a level of skill. That's correct. That's right. That's appropriate. But, um, but you learn that. And you're clearly learning it because, my word, I mean, look at that undulating fields picture. That's the show page feature image. I love it. It's fantastic. And there's, there's nothing in the slightest bit um, imposter syndrome about that. But in, but in terms of feeling imposter syndrome or like a visitor, I think of, I think of this with the, the words, you know, vive la différence, that your pictures are going to be different. They're not going to be the same. If, if you're thinking, well, they, they don't look like, I'm trying to think of, you know, Charlie Waits, um, uh, beautiful landscape. Is it Charlie Waits? Yes, Charlie Waits, beautiful landscape. So they, they don't look like Don McCullin's moody, fantastic pictures of Somerset. They don't look like, I mean, you could go on with a list forever, couldn't you really? You could. It doesn't matter because they're not you and you're not them. There we go. <laughs> I feel like I've given you a telling off. Um, I look, I know this is slightly shoehorned in to a degree, but uh, I want to play you something from episode 23. Uh, Dan Milner said, uh, you are worth your fee. And I'm kind of thinking, you know, you're, you're, you are you. You're worth your pictures. So, okay, he's used this slightly commercially, but hopefully you'll be able to substitute some of the terms that, uh, that he says. Um, money may not be essential, of course, but, it, but equally, he does talk about playing. He talks about being creative, um, being you, being different, vive la différence, uh, believing in the power that you have to, to share your work. This is Dan Milner. You are creative, you're an artist, you're different. And I think every single person is creative, but a lot of people have had it taught out of them, they've had it threatened out of them, they've had it sucked out of them in their job or their career. And so they put you on a pedestal, they put you in a different category, and that category comes with inherent power. It comes with a power to be different, to act different, to do different. And some creatives understand it, and a lot don't, and they give it away. Or they're allowed to be told, you know, like, for example, you go to a festival, a creative festival, and, and the business panel, people get up and someone on the panel will inevitably say, if you are a photographer, you have to do X. You know, everybody in this room needs an Instagram account. I'm sitting in the back of that room and I'm saying, wait a minute, you're taking this auditorium full of some of the most creative people on earth and you're telling them that they all have to do the same thing? Mm, I'm a little suspicious. Why would that be? Are you lazy? Are you trying to sell them something? Are you trying to keep them contained in the same funnel? Are you trying to keep control over them? I think creatives have far more power and far more relevance to things like the GDP than they give themselves credit for. Daniel Milner from episode 23. We're out on the photo walk this week. Just, uh, I've got closer, actually, I have come up to this. <laughs> I've come up closer to this, uh, this barn. Hang on a moment, let me get some. Look, it's been completely enveloped by the, by the grounds around it, by the vegetation around it. It's, it's taken it back. In uh, another 50 years, you probably wouldn't even see it. Let me get a picture of this for you. Hold on. So, uh, I don't want to be too close. Clouds have uh, just come across. Turn, I can probably turn my ND filter off that's on these X100s. Uh, shutter speed 400th F4. F4 nil. Do you, do you ever move off that? No, mm, I quite like it. I don't need to go too shallow with this. Let's show the barn. Yeah, perfect. Nice. Something and nothing. Scrapbook for sure. Also, the red battery lights come up. Have I got a. It's a have I got a. Hang on. Yes. Oh. Oh dear, for a moment I thought I was running on empty then. I've got a spare battery with me. I'll, uh, I'll share Dan Miller, I'll share this on the show notes. I, I, I want to give a, a big shout out, as I do each week, to two sets of very precious supporters in my life personally. And welcome to the photo walk where, where I take my microphone, you t we take our cameras, not just you, it's, it's us both together, we take our cameras. We take a saunter through the countryside, well me through the countryside, I know some people... I like their I like their urban their urban photographs. Do you know I know why I know this barn? I have been back here. I photographed a couple here. Yeah. A kind of um, a tumble down barn photograph of a couple. Yes, I thought I recognised this. I have been here. Um so yeah, so the photo walk is really a chance for us to just take a you know, take a walk in the countryside. 
have a chat about photography and share our photographs and our thoughts about why we love this thing that we do. Actually, the barn gets really big on the other side. Dare I sort of have a little explore in there? Am I going to become urbex? Trouble is, I'm too... <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit too jittery to do urbex. The wind blows through it. And you can probably hear the wind at the moment. You can, can't you? It's not a friend to the microphone. Hang on a moment. There has been some activity here because there's some, some, some tractors and tractors. Well, not so much the tractor, but the ooh. Hang on a minute. Let's get across that. Ooh. No, no, it hasn't been used for a while. There's been, there's been, been some tractors around here. I think they use it just to dump what looks like manure and stuff. I'm getting lost. Where am I? Come on, Neil, focus. Um, yes, so, yeah, <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, two sets of very precious supporters in my life personally. Well, three, actually. Those who write in and share. Those who are a part of the, the amazing Facebook group, which is almost at 1,000 uh, members. Um, and our incredible patrons as well. Uh, Thursday, we've been doing book club for a while. Yesterday, a most definite light and shade read from Eugene Richards. No doubt about that. I wondered actually how, how people would take to it, but it's a phenomenal book. We talked about that, uh, that yesterday. Are we ready for a first thing that you see? Yeah? Let me explain first thing that you see. First thing that you see is where you pick up whatever you, make your, you can make an image with right now. So you might not have your DSLR with you or your lovely, your lovely uh, mirrorless camera. You might only have something like a smartphone. It's never more than 30 centimetres away from most of us, is it? All of your life. Or an action camera. Or a pinhole camera. Or... <laughs> I'm stretching now. If you've got a Rolleiflex with you, if you have, wow. Uh, whatever you've got, whatever you can make an image with, this is the moment where we pick up our cameras and uh, I give you a countdown and you take a picture of the first thing that you see. Don't cheat. Don't be taking pictures early. And you can probably, can you hear that in the background? Here we go, look. Probably won't do it again. It's a bit of corrugated iron there. So I think I know what I'm going to do. I'm just facing it. I'm going to, I'm going to take a picture of this thing. I've walked around this barn and um, it will be the first thing. Let, let me just, I'll close my eyes, turn myself around a bit. I know the trouble is I know what... <laughs> That was ridiculous. Right, here we go. First thing that you see, get your cameras ready. I'll get mine ready. Okay, and uh, focus up or whatever you need to do. Five, four, three, two, one, and bang. There we go. Not another one, just one, that'll do. In fact, I, I didn't really like the, one, the way that I took that picture, but it's the, it's the first thing that I see. I've got to stick with that. I want to, uh, just quickly before we go on to the next mail though, um, thank uh, those that uh, have sent in their first things that you see pictures from, from last week. Actually, some of them from a, a couple of weeks ago. It's been quite popular. I, I do promise, and I genuinely mean this, that everybody who sent one in will be featured. Craig Hughes walking uh, Adrian's Wall in 25 degrees, which in some part of the world, some parts of the world right now, will be referred to as a rather coolish day. I mean, my word, the... The heat stories that we've been talking about coming out of coming out of parts of America and Canada. Um, who else do we have? Nan Nanto Sealens, amazing black and white succulent with the iPhone. Craig Hughes from the workshop, grumpy old man with a camera. <laughs> He's in the rain on the road in his truck and it's raining a lot, which will not make him any happier. Uh, Joshua Sidwell makes up for the rain though with a gorgeous sunset drive home remember these are all on the show page so if you're thinking well it's all very well Neil but I can't see them but you can you can you can they'll be on the show page which is linked to in your app and uh, and of course if you just go to photographydaily.show you'll find it nice and easy um, who else have we got? Kent Johansson, super, super moody sky on the drive home. First time coming back from working the real office since the, the pandemic began, he says. Mike Miller, deep in the woods by the looks of it. Look at those greens. Colin Mayer in what looks like a, a swamp in the outback. Watch out for those slithery things. Is, is it true that when there's, uh, when there's water you get more creepy crawlies and slippery slipperies? Or have I just made that up completely? So if yours wasn't featured this week, it will be in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, I promise. And I've kind of done a 360 around that barn and got myself a first thing that you see as well, to boot. Lovely to get a mail from former guest Angelica Schneider. She's uh, on a photo walk and, and a half, I would say. Now, you might recognise Angelica's name. 
uh, for good reason. Although I only got one photograph from her taken in a bar on one of her breaks from the walk. And I, I have written, so by the time this goes out and we get the show page up, she, she might have sent in a couple of images to uh, describe her walk a bit better. Uh, I'm hoping, hoping that she'll send some in. And Angelica, if you're listening now, where are you? Where are you on the trail? Um, remember the Camino? Yes. Hello, Neil. Remember the Camino? Are you planning your walk yet? I've made it to Spain. Yes, I can see you have. And I'm currently walking on one of the, the Camino routes. It's so good to be out there again. Of course, last year, you had to cancel, didn't you? Everything cancelled. This year, I was still surprised that you got out there. Um, well, I, don't, I, I shouldn't be surprised. I mean, you can get out there, can't you? Uh, it's, it's just about what you have to do on the way back. Oh, I still don't understand all those rules. I really don't. Of course, things are different in view of COVID, but it is workable. The most amazing thing is the discipline here when it comes to wearing masks. See photo. Ah, oh, I see where you sent that one in. It's a reference picture. Yes, they are good, aren't they? How's he, dr- <laughs> How's he drinking his coffee through the mask, though? I thought when you're sat at a bar eating and drinking, that was the time you could take your mask off. I can't seem to... I, I haven't drunk a coffee for... For 15 months now, I keep lifting the cup up, but it won't go in. So, uh, yes, being careful, she says. Sticking to the local rules makes it possible. I should explain, by the way, in case you're thinking, what are you talking about? The Camino? What is that? The Camino is, um, is well, it's a pilgrimage. Uh, Camino de Santiago, which is in, in Spain. But people walk from all over, uh, as, as you'll find out in a moment. Um, they, I mean, I think, I think you can walk from Germany, can't you? Yeah, all the way into Spain to Santiago. So uh, you can clearly see the local businesses have uh, suffered, says Angelica. She's doing the Camino at the moment and uh, still struggling or have even closed. People have been very friendly and welcoming, though. The big challenge right now is the heat and to adapt to accommodation changes. Since I'm on a less popular route, that can mean walking further to another place and to practice my Spanish by calling potential places to stay. Why is it that phone calls in another language are so challenging? Anyhow, I just wanted to let you know, so get planning for your Camino with, um, with a winky emoji there, a wink face emoji. Be careful, Neil. <laughs> I appreciate that, yes, I was trying to be. Best wishes, Angelica. Angelica, oh, lovely to hear from you. Uh, I really appreciate your mail. It was, it was a real thrill to see your name pop up in the email box. And, uh, and I tell you what was a bigger thrill, that you're actually out there doing the walk again. And you know what? I'm going to admit to a, an extremely unhealthy slice of entire envy. <laughs> it doesn't suit you, Neil. I know, but I am, because I, this is a walk I would love to do. I'm quite sure the kids would... Uh, would share my enthusiasm for it, but uh, well, may- maybe I don't know. As they they're getting older now, as they get as they as they move, as they slide towards their don't wish your life away, Neil. I know I don't I don't wish the years away. Certainly, uh, as they slide towards teenage years, I, I I'm appreciative of the fact that they'll one day turn around and say, I don't want to come on holiday with you. I want to go with my girlfriend or my boyfriend, or I want to go with a load of my mates or I can you know I know I can you know, I can I can hear it I can, I can hear the echoes of tomorrow like something out of a Charles Dickens book um but uh, yeah maybe that's the time for me to to head to the Camino at that point I think this is a good point uh, to play an excerpt from Wednesday's show finding photography again and peace in the landscape with the incredible John Brockless um there was um yeah, it, there was a real calm nature to, to John's episode. We've had two episodes in a row for very good reason. I wanted to have them back to back. Um, the bonus edition on Monday and the Wednesday before featuring, um, featuring Jason P. Howe. Uh, and that was about conflict. And some of it was, you know, hard, harder to, um, harder to, to hear, I'm, I'm sure, than, than some stuff. But, but when, when I had a, an opportunity to, to schedule John, I thought this was the perfect time. It's a very gentle interview of a, a, wonderful, a, a, a wonderful photographer who was a, a top designer, actually, a top graphic designer. He'd uh, studied photography, and then he, he kind of left photography for decades and decades and returned to it. Uh, they moved, he, he and his wife moved down to Brighton, uh, and it's a wonderful canvas from, from which to photograph. There's no doubt about that because uh, he's, a, he's a super landscape photographer. 
or seascapes. And uh, equally, he's, um, he's a very fine photojournalist as well. So, you know, when, when you get the pride parades and all those wonderful events, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's food for your lens, isn't it, really? Is that the, is that the correct expression? <laughs> I think so. Uh, but anyway, I spoke to John Brockless about the Camino because he has done the Camino himself too. So this Camino thing, this is shouting at me somewhat, isn't it? This really is. Well, I didn't. I didn't walk from uh, Germany. From Germany, <laughs> no. I did meet someone who'd walked from Belgium, though. Wow, Oof. which I was fairly impressed with. Yeah. Very impressed with. And I have met someone who's walked from his home in Sussex. Good heavens! Got on and walked out front door. Went yeah. on the South Downs way. Walked to ferry Winchester. Across. Yeah, ferry down across. Down to Portsmouth on yeah. a ferry. Off you go. <laughs> oh my word! That's an ex- that's a, oh my word! That's ex- so, extraordinary. In answer to your question, I walked half of one of the routes, which is called the Camino Frances, right? Which starts um, very near the Spanish border in in France, and I walked it from the city of Leon, which is halfway along, effectively, the northern part of Spain. <sighs> And I walked for, I think it was 314 kilometres or call it 200 miles. Fair way. Did you do it as a walk or did you do it as a photographic project? Honest answer, with two hats on. I did it as a photographer. I went with the very clear intention that if I could get enough pictures, I wanted to write a book about it because in preparing for it, I was convinced that there was no... I had not found a photo reportage showing me what it would be like to walk that route. And a lot of people want to walk it, but age catches up with them and they can't. And I felt it would be a worthwhile achievement if I could show people from a photographer's point of view what the, what the experience was like. John Brockless, listen, listen. He sort of... Oh Can you hear this? Might have to turn the uh, the volume up a bit. A hidden brook. I'm finding them all today. Wonderful, fantastic. Uh, the wonderful John Brockless. Can I say wonderful one more time. Wonderful, wonderful John Brockless. I have hinted to him actually that I'd like to go take a photo walk in Brighton. I absolutely adore the city myself. Uh, although it always feels strange to call Brighton a city. It's all this seaside town thing that I have. But of course you get. You know, these these huge towns, even larger than than Brighton, well, it's all to do with the, the cathedral, isn't it? Oh, don't go down there, Neil. Did you did you learn nothing from your schooling days? Well, I think I did. I did try to listen. Honestly, I did. Anyway, talking of coast, there's a there's a good segue. We're doing segways galore today. Uh, some people have all the luck in the world and where they live, don't they? Uh, one of those being a friend of the show, Murray McMillan. Hey, Neil. Been ages since I submitted anything to the photo walk. Uh, So here's mine. It felt good for the soul to head to Lunderston Bay, which is Gulluck, five miles from home on the banks of the Clyde in Scotland, this is, looking out towards miniature Scotland, or the Isle of Arran, as it's properly known. Just me and the team. He means the family. Um, and the X100V, so lucky to have this on our doorstep and, and even luckier to have these people in my life, all the best from Murray. Um, for, for private reasons, I think it's been a tricky week for, for Murray. Hope you don't mind me mentioning that. See, there's a, there's a gate here. I'm so tempted. Look at that walk down there. Private. Oh, CCTV in operation. What, in the middle of nowhere? Really? Who's watching it? The bull? But uh, I know it's been a tricky time, so, uh, so yeah, you, you deserved your photo walk. Very real, unreal place that you live in there. It's like something from a movie scape. It really is. I, uh, I'll put those up on the show page today, and I really appreciate you sending them in. They're fantastic. The colours, which I know is partly what we, what we can do in post-production, maybe, but it's, but, you know, it's, the X100V is, is known for its beautiful renditions, isn't it? Though... though <laughs> This is not a Fuji cast, I must remember that. But I love the pictures of the, of the family too. I really, really like the... So I think small detail family photos are great. So, yeah, you, you get the pictures of people standing together. Um, and Murray has a few of those. You know, some of his family in the, 
in the water and the waves and the sea but uh, then equally next to it you get this wonderful picture of just you know the detail of people holding hands i love that that that's uh, i think those sort of details are the pictures that are so so rarely made that are so very precious you look back at those and years and years and years to come when your girls are much much older uh, murray and you'll be thinking oh look at those so yeah, they were they were wonderful. Thank you very much for for those. Love the pics, good fun. Actually, it's good to get something like this. Shows a photo walk can be a family walk as well, doesn't it? Who else do we have? Zishan Khan, a set that he calls Umbrella Weather, <laughs> which when you see it on the show page, you'll completely understand why. Uh, shot around Harvard Square, Cambridge, in Massachusetts. Also, he's included a picture of his, of his beloved monochrome Leica, but not because he just wants to show us his Leica camera, but because he has a, an ingenious weather sealing idea involving elastic bands, which I thought was genius. So uh, I, I've popped one of those pictures up alongside the black and whites that you made as well. Um, so all these pictures that I'm mentioning here, they'll be on the show page today. And that's one of the wonderful things about this, this particular episode. It's, uh, it's an episode that you make. Um, you do. Your pictures are so integral to it. Without your pictures, it's just my set. And you don't want that. So it's, it's lovely to receive your pictures. If you can send them in, please do. The, uh, it's 2,000 pixels wide, please. That's the best way to send them in. I know not everybody sends them like that, but if you can remember to do that, fantastic. After all, it'll make your pictures look better. So send them in 2,000 pixels wide to studio at photographydaily.show. Studio at photographydaily.show. Here's one from Matthias Fox. Yes, nice to hear from you, Matthias. Hello, Neil, it's me again. Oh, I knew that. This set of photos taken in... Now, I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, I know. Um, and I, I actually looked it up on YouTube to try and make sure I could get some sort of approach to this, this Dutch pronunciation. And I'm going to completely get it wrong. Scheveningen. Scheveningen? Scheveningen? Scheveningen. Oh, I was getting closer. You've got to admit. A seaside part of The Hague, Netherlands. There was a, a severe storm out on the North Sea which guaranteed clouds and strong winds and uh, a bit of occasional rain. <laughs> you sound like a weather forecaster. My favourite weather conditions. It is, isn't it? When you get those really deep, dark, moody clouds, the ones that say, I'm coming to get you, they make fantastic photographs, particularly if you've got a really nice, grainy film stock. Wonderful. My inspiration for this short three-day trip were the photographs from the Belgian magnum photographer, Harry Groyart. I was, uh, I was looking up some Harry, actually, um, and I, I found one of his famous quotes. There is no story, it's just a question of shapes and light. Ah, <gasps> yes. Um, I, I, I must just talk about one set of, um, of his pictures. Uh, if, if you ever think, well, there's nothing to photograph... I can't go out, there's nothing, there's nothing in front of me. I've, I've, I've reached a point of nothingness. I am no longer inspired. There is a, a set of his pictures that he made, and I'll, I'll link to a film actually, which, which is uh, a YouTube film. It's quite, I think it's, uh, it's a channel that should have a lot more subscribers. The guy that, uh, mind you, a, a lot of uh, the arty channels like this, you can say the same about, can't you really? But um, yeah, he, he made a film about just this subject where Harry had made these, these, these pictures of... Well, it, it was in his front room of just what appeared on the television. And it was the work that... I, th I, I think, is it rumoured that that was the work that got him into the Magnum uh, Foundation or, or the Magnum Cooperative? Uh, just extraordinary. What a lovely story. But, but equally proves <laughs> that, there is, uh, that there are photographs in, in absolutely everything. But I'll link to that uh, super YouTube channel, quite raw, but the, uh, the photographer, as I said, he makes some super films about, about other photographers. And this story about making colour pictures from nothing is super. And Matthias, your pictures are on the show page too. Wonderful, wonderful, strong, bold, beautiful pictures of the beach in, these crazy, in this crazy dark sky mode. I have to say, it was a, I, I looked at your mail after I looked at... The other mail, which this week features the, the show page image, and you've both got superb images. And I, I was thinking, oh, I wish I could just alternate them. That would be marvellous. Uh, maybe a next set, because I know you sent in another set, which are fantastic. Anyway, here we go. Last mail of the week time. I'm looking back, by the way, along this path before we do this last mail. 
And you know that, um, that wonderful old tumble-down barn that I was talking about? Well, it's now at the end of this, of this sort of farm track, and it's just sort of, it's appearing, and it's kind of, well, it's found itself a, as a natural vignette. It's, 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 it's sort of framed by all the, sort of the trees that are arcing over this, this, uh, this path, this track towards it. So there we go, there's a picture. I'll pop that on the show page as well. So I didn't grab the ISO and stuff for you then, did I? Uh, right, last mail of the week time. Here's, um, here's one from Paige Grierson. Hello, Paige. Hello, hello, Neil. I recently joined the podcast as a listener, and I'll admit I'm not really a photographer. I'm involved with design and magazine layout, and it was a colleague who I work with as a photographer who told me about your Friday photo. Well, we don't have to be a photographer. I'd like to think that one thing that happens during that, I mean, we do talk about technical stuff sometimes, and I know we talk about composition and so on, but I like to think that actually, you know, anybody could join us with their iPhone and just come for a walk. That's what, that's, that's the plan. That's, that's what I really want this show to be. Anyway, sorry, Paige. Um, I don't even listen to it on a walk. It's always on my commute in and out of Manchester. I know I don't really dot all the I's and cross the T's when it comes to the show, but I do like to travel with my camera. See, right at the end, Paige, you rescued yourself. Only kidding. An episode that I really enjoyed was your conversation with uh, Marissa Roth, episode 232, shooting your big life-changing project. It certainly struck a chord with me as a place I'd like to visit, but also on the level of finding something that you're passionate about, finding a life project. I'm not sure it was Marissa's life project. I mean, or maybe she, maybe that's how it um, communicated to you. I, sp- I suppose it could have been. Um, I think this last year, says Paige, for many of us has been about renewal and reinvention. You see, I said we had another mail coming up about this. And it was uh, wonderful to hear someone talk so candidly about life-changing moments during a time many of us are desperate for a change of sorts. I hope I'm making sense. I think you are, yes. I think that's uh, what this time has been. Anyway, Paige says she spoke, this is Marissa, she spoke in a way that was devoid of complication, as pure as the people she photographed in a part of Tibet that was clearly very special to her, despite the politics. All my best, Paige. And I will be sending my Manchester journey pictures sometime. You have been warned. Oh, you don't need to warn us. I'm looking forward to that already. It's quite fun, actually, to see some of the urban travels that you, you make. I know that not everybody listens to this podcast on, on their photo walks of a Friday or of a weekend or any day of the week that you, that you listen to this particular episode. Sometimes I, I know it's... I know you're sat there in the train looking out to one side, so all the... Well, not the car. You shouldn't, shouldn't be making photographs while you, while you drive. I know some of you do. <laughs> uh, I'm not here to judge... Um, but uh, yeah, so some of those urban urban scenes. Actually, if you're walking through the streets with your camera as you're listening to a podcast, yeah, grab some of those grab some of those commuter pictures. But uh, thank you, thank you, Paige. And I, th- I think it's wonderful that guests do feel comfortable to to, to open up. And uh, Marissa certainly did. Should we just play some Marissa Roth? Yes, that would be a good idea. Here's Marissa Roth from that episode. Then talking about her her wonderful love affair. With, uh, with making those pictures in Tibet. I always had like a, I don't know, like a thing for Tibet. I can't explain it. And um, at one point I was visiting a friend in India and he was a journalist and he had to go to Pakistan for work. And I ended up going down to Goa, India by myself, uh, just to take a little break and met some Tibetan refugees who just literally had a blanket on the side of the road selling, you know, jewelry and things. And anyway, I bought this necklace. I don't know if you you wearing it yeah yeah so i've literally been wearing this necklace for 32 years every day wow and the husband he said to me he said this will always bring you luck and i I don't know it's like there's something very deep inside of me that tibet and the tibetans just resonate with me so i had always wanted to go there um and then decided to go there for my 50th birthday it was a remarkable trip. Um, I didn't know if I would photograph, you know, if I, if I would be inspired to photograph. Before the trip, I did a lot of thinking, what do I want to photograph with? And I knew I didn't want to photograph black and white. Um, and I was familiar sort of 
sort of with the color palette of Tibet through other photographers' work. And so I decided on Kodachrome mm. as the film I would use. Marissa Roth. And you can hear about the adventure on episode 232. And that's it for today. Keep sending your questions or feedback to studio at photographydaily.show so that I can feature you in this mailbag edition. If you made a first thing that you see picture, or indeed for any of your pictures that you've made making a photo walk, uh, the email address to send them to is the same one. 2,000 pixels, please, on the wide side, if you can manage. If it's your first time walking with us, thank you. And I'd love to hear from you, because without you, it's a, a very quiet walk. In your show notes on this app, unless you're listening online already, there's a link to take you to the show page so you can see the fabulous pictures that accompany this edition and other important links that we've talked about. If you could do something for me this week, I'd be very grateful if you could share the show page link on your Twitter or Facebook, maybe Vero, or in a social group. That's if you like the show, of course, just to say, oh, there's this photography podcast that goes out and about each Friday with a mailbag full of thoughts from other photographers who make pictures as they go along, that sort of thing. This autumn, I shall be making some walks further afield, I hope, and who knows, that could be with you. Thanks to MPB.com, the number one team when it comes to buying you, selling your used or trading in Europe, the UK and the States. Thanks also to our wonderful patrons who support this show and make it possible that it's here week after week. Of course, on Thursdays, there's your special private members only show on your Patreon app, which is very easy to download. And we link to it on the front of our web page. It's a diary type feature following my thoughts as a working photographer. And I'm keen as more time allows and the patronage supports it, that it will expand across the week. For the moment, it's Thursdays, yes, accompanied by Book Club. And I'm very excited about the next book, which is Beaten Grove by Chris Hunt, who lived in that road in the 70s about two miles outside the centre of Manchester. After a year of living there, he asked everyone in the street if he could just come and make pictures as they, well, lived. And the result is supremely interesting and I think very inspiring for us all. And I'd like to talk about that on Thursday next. Music in the show was from Artlist.io and I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you next time. There we go. There's car. I can see your car. Oh, I can see you. I know. Look. Look at you. You're at the end of a tree-lined avenue. Shall I get a photograph of you? We haven't. I don't think we've ever photographed you for the photo walk, have we? Oh, let me show you my best side. That's the back of you. That's my best side. Hmm. Just like you. Thank you. No need to be rude. Oh, let's get a picture. There we are. There's car at the end of a tree-lined avenue. Just move your wheel a bit there, car. Is this all right? Yeah. Does my boot look big in this? <laughs> no. You look fabulous. Go on. Let's go home. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.